Sunny, yesterday my life was filled with rain. Sunny, you smiled at me and really eased the pain. Hello, everyone. Welcome to an episode of the Podcast Boys, where me and my uh, co-host, Connor Nielsen. Connor, how are you doing today? Doing gangbusters. How are you doing? I am doing very well. Uh, Connor and I, uh, we talk about things, uh, movies and TV shows that have someone who was uh, connected to the television series Twin Peaks uh, or the film spinoff uh, Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me. Uh, we've been doing this for a little while now, uh, and uh, today we are talking about the 1997 film Boogie Nights. Uh, the Twin Peaks connection is Heather Graham, uh, who was in Fire Walk With Me in the last uh, half of uh, Twin Peaks Season 2. Uh, and uh, this has uh, got a huge cast in it. Uh, Burt Reynolds, Julianne Moore, uh, John C. Riley, uh, Mark Wahlberg, Heather Graham, Don Cheadle, uh, William H. Macy. So a lot of actors, even if you don't know their names, there's probably got someone who you would say, I recognize them from somewhere. Uh, and uh, this is about the uh, blossoming uh, porn scene of the late 1970s, early 1980s. Uh, and uh, it features... Uh, Mark Wahlberg uh, playing a, uh, I guess, a character he has created for himself, uh, Dirk Diggler, as he, uh, it's kind of his rise and fall uh, in the biz. Uh, so, uh, Connor, uh, why don't you tell us, uh, I guess I accidentally just kind of did the uh, plot <laughs> synopsis, I apologize, we had just, not even five minutes before we recorded, we, we were working out who was going to do the plot synopsis, and I accidentally just took over that, so I apologize. Um, Connor, well, what... don't, don't worry, don't worry, I did that for the longest day, so oh, okay. we're all um, what did you think of this movie? You you had seen it before, right? Yeah, so recently my brother got laid off from his job, and when he got laid off, his uh, boss had said, Hey, Spencer, you like movies? Uh, I, here are some movies that you have not seen that I really like. So he gave him a stack of movies, and I had he gave him a stack of four movies. I had seen Fight Club, but I had not seen High Fidelity, gross point blank and boogie nights and the first movie we watched out of that stack was boogie nights because we were actually at thanksgiving with our mom and we asked her of those four movies which one should we watch first and she said oh my gosh i love boogie nights you should watch boogie nights and i knew the premise of this i knew mark Wahlberg plays a rising porn star pardon the pun named Dirk diggler and um I, I and I I just kind of figured by the subject matter it would be something my mom would absolutely not be interested in, and so her saying she loved it, and it being directed by Paul Thomas Anderson, who is a bit of a, uh, he's sort of like a Quentin Tarantino, mm -hmm. like he's sort of from that same era where he's like a writer director auteur who doesn't make he's not like super prolific the way, um like. I don't know, Christopher Nolan is, where Christopher Nolan like puts out a movie every two years, almost like clockwork. Um, but he's sort of like this art house guy who can hit the mainstream early on in his career, like Quentin Tarantino, Paul Thomas Anderson did. And so I've not seen a whole lot of Paul Thomas Anderson's films. Uh, and so this is one of his early movies. This is back when like his movies were really big hits and it has a really great cast. So um, when I watch this, I, uh, I really, really liked it, and I watched it, and I thought, I want to watch this again. So that's why I said we should watch it, and I was, more than anything, just kind of curious how you would respond to this, because I doubt this is a subject matter that really interests you, but I was wondering if you would have a similar response to my mother or not. So that was kind of like the, the personal experiment on my end. So I actually kind of love this movie, and I was surprised that I did, because I do love like the 70s aesthetically, but... Like, just the porn industry is just not something that interests me, like, at all. So I was pleasantly surprised because it's not really a movie about porn. It's kind of like a Scorsese movie that, you know, the, the environment they live in is this sort of porn world of, like, this kind of, like, family, like, this makeshift family of kind of broken, sad people who kind of find comfort in one another at least for a, a, a certain amount of time mm -hmm. uh but comics kid how did you feel about boogie nights uh i did not hate this movie uh, i was kind of when you said uh the last time we recorded when you said we were going to talk about this my stomach kind of sank a little bit i was not <laughs> not looking forward to this uh both the two and a half hour runtime was kind of making me dread it and also uh this seems like something that like 
true cinephiles will like pour themselves some scotch and put on their robe <laughs> and get in their smoking chair and say, my dear fellow, this movie, like, even though, you know, it's, it appears to be kind of smutty, it, it is in the same way that Rocky is not a boxing movie. It's a movie about a boxer. Uh, this is a movie that has porn as a subject matter, but it's not a porno. You know what I'm saying? It's about mm -hmm. human beings and their journey that they go through. Um, and uh, I ended up, I watched it uh, this morning, and uh, I did not hate this movie. Uh, I probably would not watch it again. Uh, I, I won't say I loved this movie. Uh, there are a few things that I think the movie thinks it's doing better than what it actually is, uh, mm -hmm. but I enjoyed myself more than I thought I would. Okay. Cool. Where do you want to go with this? Because there's a lot of places, I think, there's a lot of characters, and mm -hmm. it kind of starts off as like a singular protagonist sort of a thing, and then as it goes along, it sort of branches out into a bunch of different places, so. Yeah, and that's where I, as I was, you know, an hour into the movie, I thought, this could probably have trimmed off about 45 minutes, and then I was trying <laughs> to think to myself, well, which character would I have trimmed out if I was, you know, if, if, Paul Thomas Wes Anderson came to me and said, <laughs> uh, you know, we need you to uh, to trim the movie. The, the, the studio says it has to be 45 minutes shorter. I would look at this, and at first I would say, yeah, two and a half hours, let's get that trimmed down. But then I would say, I don't know what to trim. Uh, because even if you just said, like, let's, let's get rid of Seymour Hoffman's character. Um, yeah, let's get rid of Scotty. Um, it, it's hard to just get rid of him because he's there in scenes where he's not the main focus. Uh, you know, there's there's one or two scenes where he's kind of like, he's there and he's prevalent, but he's also in, like in the background. Like there's that scene where uh, uh, Thomas Jane is convincing uh, John C. Riley and Mark Wahlberg, like we're gonna go and rob uh, Dr. Octopus uh, and uh, Seymour Hoffman is there and he's like, uh, you guys be careful. And they're like, shut up, Scotty. And so like, that's not a Scotty scene, but if you tried to trim his subplot out of the movie, it would be really weird watching it and be like, wait, who's this guy? Um, and so, like, it's a movie that, uh, this is going to sound weird, it's kind of like the TV show Lost, how, like, you'll have an episode where it's like, we're going to do a Saeed flashback, and then Kate's dad will be in the flashback, and he's connected to Saeed. And then, I got you, yeah. And so it's like that. I mean, there's not flashbacks. It's all linear and chronological, but every character is in every other character's subplot almost. Uh, so, like, if you tried to cut Don Cheadle out of the movie, that'd be difficult to do. I mean, you, you, you'd you have to go to the script and do it. You know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, you you yeah. wouldn't be able to cut anything from this movie as it was shot. You would have to go to the script and say, let's get rid of this character or whatever. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting how if you're getting tired of watching Mark Wahlberg, then wait five minutes, and then you'll get a scene with some other characters. Um, I mean, Mark Wahlberg is the main character, if I would have to say. Uh, but mm -hmm. then he's like the 10th one credited on Internet Movie Database. <laughs> um, but uh, maybe I, that's not the best example. Like, if you didn't care for, uh, you know, seeing uh, Julianne Moore and uh, Heather Graham, then they're there together in a couple of scenes, but then you'll move on to someone else. Right. That is something that I th is actually, a, I think, a pretty cool place to start because um, I think that ties into w one of the things that I think is very impressive about this movie, uh, but it, it's sort of a double-edged sword. Um, so this was Paul Thomas Anderson's second feature film, and he was 26 years old when he made this. So if anybody ever wants to feel inadequate, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not as, it's not as uh, you know, staring into the abyss – like depression worthy as like Orson Welles being 25 years old when he made Citizen Kane. Mm -hmm. uh, I am 25 years old now. <laughs> um, but, but I mean, Paul Thomas Anderson, I, I, I think just from a direction level, this is kind of amazing. Like just from like the word go, that opening shot is a very show off. Look how good I am at making movies kind of a shot. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing that I think about this movie that, that I'm kind of the, 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 the point I'm arriving at is, uh, this is a film by a young filmmaker and it has all the good things that come with that and some of the bad things. Uh, it is very passionate. It has a lot of energy. It has a lot of heart. It, it has uh, a love for its characters, like all of its characters. I, I have a feeling Paul Thomas Anderson likes all of them. And the flip side of that is it's very self-indulgent. Um, it likes to just hang out and do its own thing. 
And um, I also think that its influences are very, very apparent. Um, and I guess like Spencer and I, when we watched this movie, the uh, we were actually comparing this to the recent Joker movie mm-hmm. where it's very obvious when you watch this and when you watch Joker that both Paul Thomas Anderson and Todd Phillips really like Martin Scorsese, where this movie is kind of pulling from uh, Goodfellas. I see a lot of Goodfellas in this, and from what I hear, there's a lot of Raging Bull in this movie. I've not seen Raging Bull, but when you watch um, Joker, there's a lot of Taxi Driver and King of Comedy influence there. Mm-hmm. And, and they both both of these films wear their influence on their sleeve, I think. It's not trying to act like nobody's going to notice. But I think like when it comes to like, a young filmmaker – it's one of those things where you say, wow, Paul, you did a really good job directing this. I can tell you're really passionate about this, but you can lay off the Scorsese a little bit, buddy. <laughs> and also, like, I, I don't necessarily mind the self-indulgence, but it is two and a half hours. And my brother said this was the fastest two and a half hours of his life. I, I felt the two and a half hours myself. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, that being said, I, I do think the strengths of you know the young filmmaker kind of trademarks in this movie outweigh the bad okay yeah um there's a couple of things i'm going to want to return to with what you just said um for one i i think i'm probably somewhere in between you and your brother uh talking about how long it is because i do think that with it having such a uh, ensemble cast that it helps that if you are getting tired that eventually you're going to kind of move on to a different subplot it doesn't move as fast as maybe other ensemble pieces might, uh, but I did have to pause a couple times to kind of take a break um, to kind of give myself some space. But speaking of Joker, that movie is about two hours long, I think, and I feel like that movie, because you're following one character throughout the whole movie, that that probably feels to me as long as this movie does. Uh, And it, you know, it's a shorter movie, but it felt longer than what it was Mm -hmm. because you were just zeroed in on one person uh, whereas this you know you've, you've got a wider net that we're casting and so you can kind of uh, I don't know when you I guess the movie almost when it feels like maybe we've lingered on this subplot and this character too long now we can go to someone else and kind of show what they're doing for a little bit uh, yeah that, that's a good that's a good point um, uh, is there anything else you wanted to return to uh, I've never seen uh, Goodfellas or uh, Raging Bull so I'm very much a virgin when it comes to uh, Scorsese. Uh, I think the only film he's done that I have seen is The King of Comedy. Uh, so uh, I, mm. watching this, I was not getting a feeling of Scorsese because I have not seen those movies that uh, Paul W. S. Anderson has. Uh, I'm going. I'm doing this deliberately, by the way. I'm. I'm <laughs> uh, I talked about the Anderson brothers the last time we spoke, so I'm. Uh, but anyway, I. When when you said that, I made like shifty eyes at my computer, going, "Is he doing that on purpose?" <laughs> <laughs> um, I should have said nothing. I should have just let it be a mystery. Um, but I, I was not going to correct you. Okay. Um, I, I have not seen just a whole lot of movies that uh, uh, Scorsese has done. So I um, didn't notice the influence here as much as, you know, you're much more into, I, I would have, without, if you hadn't said anything, I would have assumed you had seen most of Scorsese's films. So I, it makes sense that you noticed that influence here. Yeah, um, I have actually not seen King of Comedy, and uh, I have not seen Raging Bull. Like, I, I guess the, the Scorsese movies I'm familiar with are like the the ones about the guys who the rags to riches to rags stories that he does, mm-hmm. um, which I think might include Raging Bull. I don't know. I have not seen it, but uh, like I'll say, like the the biggest influence of Goodfellas I see in this is so Goodfellas is about this young man, and he he really wants to be a gangster, so he becomes a gangster from a very young age. And then, you know, think he gets more and more powerful and he's, you know, just living the life and whatnot. And then halfway through about halfway through the movie, he gets sent to prison and like a lot of people are on probation. So they got to keep things, you know, down low. And so in order to make money, because everything's are down low, he's got to kind of the main guy's got to sort of do things on his own. So he starts selling drugs and he starts selling cocaine and then things start to spiral out of control. And this movie is about a young man who kind of wants to get into the porn industry. And then he does, and then things are going great for about half the movie, and then somebody sticks a gun in their mouth, and then he gets onto the drugs, and then things go out of control, and then it spirals out of control. And you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. like, and specifically the back half relating a lot to drugs, where they start having to sell drugs. Um, that's kind of the part of the movie 
So, so I, I really, I, okay, I guess I should just say, like, this is a movie you can pretty much divide into two halves. Um, I think the first half of this movie is kind of perfect, and in a way that's, like, like I, you know, kind of, if I'm completely, you know, subjective, like, I'm, like, in the middle of writing a screenplay that I was like, man, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to handle the last half of this movie, or this last half of this screenplay, and then I watched the first half of this movie, and it kind of gave me that answer. So in that way, I kind of needed this movie, and it was, like, enlightening and really cool, because um, that's really where it's about, like, a surrogate family, and people are in the middle of, like, making something, and it's, like, a collaborative effort, and, and there's, like, a lot of... It, it, it does a lot of really, I think, unique world building, and, and it kind of builds a, a, a world with, I think, pretty unique characters, and you don't really see a world like this depicted in movies very often. And so I found all that pretty uh, gripping. And then the second half, they just start selling drugs. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like I've seen that countless times. Why does that have to be in this movie? You know what I'm saying? Uh, but like you said – there's a lot of different subplots going on specifically in the second half. So while I think Dirk's story became kind of disappointingly conventional for what I found to be a very unconventional and very exciting way, kind of a movie. Uh, I thought that the back half, like while on a plot level, I was a little disappointed. I do think that that back half does have just a ton of really, really good scenes. The part where Don Cheadle goes to buy donuts mm-hmm. is insanely like i think brilliant like it is it's like a great moral dilemma that it ends on Mm -hmm. and then uh the part where they you know tom thomas jane takes john c Riley and uh mark Wahlberg to go to dr octopus's house Mm -hmm. that scene is super intense oh yeah like it's great (laughs) it was already like the scene is already intense if you watch it muted because you're like, okay, you see they, they've got the, the fake cocaine and then they, you know, Thomas Jane pulls out a gun and then John C. Riley and Mark Wahlberg start panicking and then John C. Riley sees that the guy who answered the door also has a gun and so they're, they're like nervous. But what adds to the tension is that, uh, you know, Alfred Molina's uh, friend is there just randomly firing fireworks. And so they're, they like, they each jump every time that happens. And I jump every time it happens. I'm like, Oh, I, I just want this scene to be over. Like it's, it's gripping, but I want it to be over. I'm ready for them to, to get out somehow. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I was that same way. It's, and like the soundtrack is cool. And Alfred Molina is like so coked out and he's really unpredictable. So you don't know what he's going to do. Um, by the way, this is – I don't know if I'm ever going to have another chance to say this. I had no idea that was Thomas Jane while I was watching it. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, he, I knew he was in the movie, uh, but I did not know who he played. And it was three or four scenes in before I realized, wait, that's Thomas Jane. Um, if you ever get a chance to watch the uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer movie uh, with Christy Swanson, he is in that. He plays a very minor character in that movie, and he looks very similar to how he looks here. Oh, okay, uh, with okay. With the mustache. Because um, the first thing I ever saw with him was the Punisher, and he looks nothing like he does here. <laughs> um, absolutely nothing. Uh, but, uh, yeah, he, he is – if you've seen the Punisher, then he's virtually unrecognizable here. Yeah, um... You know who I thought he was? Ooh. I thought he was uh, Hector Hammond from the Green Lantern. Oh, movie. okay, yeah, one of the Sarsgaard. And I was like, yeah, it's like because it's weird. It's it's not he's not one of the Sarsgaard right, brothers. It's Sars, Peter Sarsgaard. He's he's Sarsgaard. Yeah. <laughs> like that that blew my mind up when I found out that he wasn't a part of the Sarsgaard family. I'm like, wait, hold, on, I've been saying this wrong the whole time. But yeah, it's prob- and I'm probably like, wow. it's probably a couple generations back. They were all the same clan, and then there was a bitter uh, argument, and then. One brother left and added an extra A in his name and said, no longer am I a Scar, but a Sar. <laughs> That's great. Um, and then independently, pretty... both branches of the family ended up in Hollywood, and so now it's like they don't <laughs> talk to each other. Uh, well, what I was going to say, though, is I was I was looking at him, and I thought, oh, wow, that guy is not aged in, like, 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then I was just waiting for his name in the credits and said Thomas Jane played this person. That was – wait, no, that wasn't Thomas Jane. Are you Are you serious? Yeah. Um, it took me it, when he was when he first shows up at the at one of the parties. I didn't know who he was. Um, I don't remember when I figured out who he was, but it took a few scenes of him being in it for me to realize it. Um, I did have a question. Uh, I might not have been paying enough attention, but I thought that uh, Mark Wahlberg and John C. Riley. I thought they were just addicted to cocaine. I didn't get the feeling that they were selling drugs also, because because um... they go to Alfred Molina's house specifically to sell him baby powder so that they can get more money, and I assumed that the money was just so they could buy more real cocaine for themselves. 
Yeah, that's true. I, I guess the maybe I, I don't think yeah. But it, you, it's still you're still thinking it's still a very conventional uh, rise and fall type story, right? Yeah. Um, so I don't know. There's a there's a uh, I'm gonna try to speak in coded language. I, I uh, maybe this isn't gonna be helpful, but I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do it. Um, there is a a YouTube movie reviewer um, who wants to be like a movie maker. Uh, he went he went to uh, film school, and uh, he he has made short films and like you know web series. Uh, and you can tell he really likes Goodfellas. He's actually said that Goodfellas is his favorite film, and all of his movies are exactly the same. Mm -hmm. They're just Goodfellas, you know, except instead of cocaine, it's pot. You know what I mean? And it's like. Oh, I and then they get in deep, and then they gotta sell some weed. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. it's like, uh, or 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 you know, things aren't going their well well, and they're desperate, and then and so they gotta score some weed, and they all wear basketball shorts and they all wear t-shirts, and and that's what it is. And you go, oh, and so it's like this is like kind of taking us like the structure of something like Goodfellas and kind of shaking it up with something new. Mm -hmm. And I thought the way they shook it up was cool. And then in the second half, it was like not as shaken up as that first half. So yeah, I, I, I was, I would say mildly disappointed for something that I thought was so like unique and exciting. I hear you. Um, and again, if I had seen more good or more uh, Scorsese, I might be more on that uh, with you. Um, I'm trying to think of where else we might want to go with this. Um, since we're, uh, since I'm asking you questions, I have a question about uh, Roller Girl, the character played by Heather Graham. So. The first we see her is in the opening scene. She is a waitress at uh, Louise Guzman's uh, nightclub. And uh, Burt Reynolds and Julianne Moore, they go in, and Julianne Moore is having a conversation with Roller Girl. She says something about, you're going to have to call them tomorrow, otherwise it'll be the weekend. You won't get it, be able to get in touch with anyone. And I didn't know what they were talking about. But then the next we see, Heather Graham is, I believe, in high school. And then uh, a guy is making suggestive, uh, uh, crude uh, faces toward her, uh, and uh, she rolls on out of this classroom. Now, at that moment, was she acting in any of Burt Reynolds' uh, productions, or did she join him and Julianne Moore after she rolled out of the classroom? See, I get the impression that she was in his productions already while she was in school. Okay, yeah. and that maybe the guy making the faces at her, he was aware of that, maybe? Yeah, okay. maybe he had seen some of these uh, productions. So, yeah, um, that's one of the things that I wanted. So this movie does have like a really kind of unsettling underbelly to it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, while you're watching it for the first time, like it's really fun because, hey, these are all kind of fun characters. And, you know, I really don't have interest in pornography like, at all. So it's like I, I thought I was going to be bored, but like – like like you said, like like Rocky, it's not a movie about sports. It's a movie about a guy who is a boxer. Mm -hmm. And this similarly sort of has that. And it kind of shows you like – you know what? Like it shows like what the lifestyle is like and why that lifestyle can be appealing and, and the sense of belonging that people have and and all that. And, and, uh, but, and so like you really buy into that feeling that Mark Wahlberg is feeling and why he goes down, you know, this, this career – path but when i was watching it again it's it's like julianne moore is kind of predatory in this in this early on and and as you can kind of infer from roller girl like the same thing has happened to her and and uh and it's kind of like but then you also have to think like once their kind of family you know kind of breaks up and you know the the the, the porno theater industry is sort of being broken up and it's kind of like due to the rise of video and how the landscape is changing and they can't really capture the magic that they had in the seventies. You get this like impression that like it's revealing something that was like always there. And like, you start to see like the, how sleazy and crimey it really is. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, like, but, but like what, what you see though is like their lifestyle is the better option. And that's really kind of sad, mm -hmm. but for them, it's not sad. It's the positive. Yeah, and I don't know. Like, it's a really complicated, like, really morally ambiguous way of looking at it because, like, you look at Mark Wahlberg's home life; it sucks, mm -hmm. and so you understand why he like finds you know the the porn life so appealing, and he's like accepted, and everybody wants to be his friend and whatnot, and 
but like at the same time, like Julianne Moore is like using like predatory practices on him. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's not cool. I don't know. I think it's like a, even while like, like even while you're having fun in the first half, there is this seedy underbelly that runs throughout the entire movie. Yeah. And why don't you uh, explain more about Julianne Moore? Because I was, it looked to me like uh, Jack played by uh, Burt Reynolds. It looked like he was kind of the one like uh, he, he sees, I'm just, I don't know how else to say this. He sees Mark Wahlberg at the nightclub and then he instantly like he, you know, he zooms in on this guy and then he follows him to the back room and he's basically saying, uh, you know, I make adult films. Would you like to be, uh, come meet with me and we can talk about a job opportunity. And Mark Wahlberg says no. And then Jack leaves. And then we zoom down to Mark Wahlberg's waist and we see he has a quite a large package. Uh, there's no delicate way of putting it. He's, you know, he's got a lot to work with. And we see that at the end of the movie. Uh, and, uh, but then Mark Wahlberg has said, you know, thanks, but no thanks. Uh, I couldn't walk out on, uh, uh, the guy who owns the nightclub like that. And then the next time that Jack is there, he sends Roller Girl to go, uh, do something with her. If you've seen the movie, you know, I, how I, it's going to be really difficult to be PG yeah. about this, but he sends her to perform a sexual, uh, activity with Mark Wahlberg and then uh, Mark Wahlberg is walking home and then Jack and Julianne Moore and Roller Girl are in the car and they pull up to him and Jack says you know hey let me give you a ride and Mark Wahlberg says no thanks and then Roller Girl says do you remember me from a couple of hours ago and I'm not joking that's an actual line of dialogue she says do you remember me from a couple of hours ago and he says yeah and then she says come on inside and so it seems to me like Jack is being very predatory. Like he's, he's... You, You're right. He is. He is. Um, but why um, don't you explain how Julianne Moore is as well? Well, I, I – yeah, I actually wanted to respond to that because you are right. Like at the top of this empire is Jack. And if you're going to just like look at the way the hierarchy is, like she is kind of serving him. And so, yeah, he's like the top predator out of all of them. Mm -hmm. um, but, I th but he does seem to like – I'm trying to figure out how to word this <laughs> because it, it, it is very like it, – it's a – I don't know. I'm not used to talking about this kind of subject. Mm -hmm. um, but Julianne Moore, um, she sees Mark Wahlberg and she likes Mark Wahlberg. And it's very clear she wants Mark Wahlberg uh, in the biblical sense. And she is a woman who is maybe in like her mid-30s and he's 17. He's like the same age as a roller girl, I mm -hmm. believe. They're, they're 17, like, when they're starting. This spans, I think, like, six years. So, um, but, yeah, when they're starting, he's 17, and she kind of manipulates social situations so she can be in intimate scenarios with him. And uh, even during their first scene that they do together, she, like, wants him to change the blocking of the scene. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, and, and, like, she clearly has, like, a lot of, like, emotional issues and like uh some because like she is like estranged from her husband or they're separated or maybe they are divorced and she actually has a son uh but you know who, she due to not, like... who she's not allowed to be near um she has, yes, she has yeah. split custody with him and then because she is d uh, addicted to drugs uh and presumably was arrested and charged with drug possession because we're jumping around, but late in the movie, uh, when every character is hitting rock bottom, she goes to try and rearrange their custody arrangement, and the judge says, okay, when, why was this not honored, and what were you arrested for, uh, and when was the last time you were arrested? And then we cut to Julianne Moore crying. So mm -hmm. she has lost her matriarchal relationship, and so she has latched on to this other guy in a very unhealthy way to try yeah, to, try to like reclaim that. It's like she wants her son and her husband in one, and she sees that in Mark Wahlberg's character. Yes. It's sort of like this reverse Oedipus complex. Or you know an, I mean? an Electra complex, as they sometimes call it. Oh, is that what that's called? I, I okay, think okay. so. I, I, I think Oedipus is when a guy has a thing for his mom, and Electra is when a woman has a thing. So, no, a woman has a thing for her dad, so I really don't know what you call it when. I guess it is kind of Oedipus, sort of, yeah. Um, I, I just put my foot in my mouth because I don't know. It's okay. I don't know Jack <laughs> about Greek stuff. Um, um, uh, no, but, you, but you're you, you know you're Arthurian legend, so that, that's yeah. for you. That's where <laughs> you can come on. It. Um, but yeah, no, it is like a like a weird thing. I think like um, Jack is predatory in the in like like a business sense. He's very charismatic, and they got like Burt Reynolds for this role. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like he, he's a very charismatic guy, 
And, you know, Julianne Moore has been playing, like, the attractive cougar-esque kind of woman for her entire career. So, like, you know what I mean? Like, I understand the allure they represent for the young people they bring in. Um, but, like, I, I, I want to bring up Julianne Moore because, like, her connection with, with um, Dirk, Dirk Diggler does extend beyond the business sense. She does have, like, an emotional kind of manipulation element to it as well. Yeah. Um, but it, what I thought was really interesting about this movie is how you really see how this industry burns through its talent um, and how like everybody wants bright young faces. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I just thought it was interesting how like even someone like Jack, who has sort of been like kind of a bit of a King in the industry, like by the time, like they're, everyone's hitting rock bottom and there's this really uncomfortable scene in a limo. Mm -hmm. Somebody tells him that his films suck now. Mm -hmm. And it's like, <laughs> you know, like he's even like on his way out. And like, this is just an industry that even more than any other industry, because that's just kind of the way industry works in this, you know, system. Like even he's getting churned out faster than someone of his stature in another industry might have. So, and I took that when he said your films suck now, I took that to be so that's the part, like you said, everyone is hitting rock bottom at this point. Uh, Dirk is, uh, you know, addicted to cocaine. He tried the music uh, scene. I, <laughs> I got the feeling that I, I did not think he was a very good singer, and I don't know if that's just no. that Mark Wahlberg isn't a good singer or that he's playing someone who's not a good singer. But then he and John C. Riley, they need the demo tapes so that they can make money, so that they can pay for the demo tapes, and it's not they're not going to budge. And then so it's like, okay, now we're pretty much like resorting to robbing Alfred Molina so that we can get more drugs. And then like uh, Mark Wahlberg gets beat up by some people in a scene that I was confused about, but I don't. I'm not, I was a little confused okay, by it too. I'm not going to ask any questions because it's it's going to be difficult to talk about <laughs> that. But um, he he his hello point is where he's getting beat up for uh, performing sexual favors for money, and uh, then he goes back to Jack and he says, "I'm sorry," and. I guess we're just going to get right into the part that I didn't care for with the movie. So I feel like, and and when you were kind of illustrating that Julianne Moore has like a very matriarchal but also sexual relationship with uh, Mark Wahlberg's character, that makes one aspect of this movie make a lot more sense. Because there's one part where Julianne Moore and Roller Girl are uh, talking about, you know, she says, I miss Dirk. Because uh, for anyone who hasn't seen the movie... It's a, it's a rise and fall. So at the peak of everything, uh, Dirk is addicted to cocaine, and he comes out and says, I'm ready to start filming. And uh, Burt Reynolds says, it's going to be about 20 minutes. And then Dirk is like, no, we have to do it now. Uh, biologically, I'm not even going to get into that, but you know, you can Google it if you're interested. And so uh, <laughs> then basically Burt Reynolds, it, 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 get, it becomes an ego clash. And Burt Reynolds finally says, you, you, you're high on coke. You look like you haven't slept in days. I'm not going to film you like this. And so... Uh, it's a situation of you're fired slash I quit. And then um, so that's where uh, Dirk and John C. Riley and Scotty, they kind of break off from the rest of the characters to go do their own thing. And then uh, Heather Graham and Julianne Moore, they're talking and Julianne Moore says, I miss Dirk. Uh, don't you miss Dirk? And she says, yeah, I miss Dirk. And uh, and then I was over here thinking, why? Why do you miss Dirk? What What is it about him as a person that you guys loved because they, they even said I love that guy uh, and at one point one of them says he's very talented uh, but like there's a scene early in the movie where Dirk is showing Julianne Moore his apartment and he's like look at all the nice furniture look at these expensive paintings look I've got a nice car that's really expensive uh, and I was feeling like in that scene with uh, Heather Graham and Julianne Moore that they miss him but not him as a person they miss like mm. him as a status symbol like he was our golden goose uh you know there's that scene where like he's getting all these awards and it's like yeah you know he's uh our business is doing great because of this well-endowed guy who came in and like set our set the world on fire um and i was feeling like there was a situation of i miss him because now you know this one guy says your movies suck now and i took that to mean dirk diggler is not in your movies anymore they're no good without him and mm. so at the end, uh, Dirk comes back and says, I'm sorry, and then they hug. And I thought, eh, it's not a sincere, genuine apology because they both realize that they need each other. Like, Dirk doesn't want to be turning favors in a car for money. He wants to go back to the good life that he had. And Jack realizes his movies aren't any good with this new kid that he has. So he, you know, eventually, you know, Dirk isn't going to be doing this business anymore. But, like, Jack realizes maybe he can reclaim some of that uh, fire that he had when Dirk first started doing movies with him. Uh, and so I got the feeling that, you know, when they were talking about, oh, I miss Dirk, 
I got the feeling it wasn't sincere. But then you pretty much spelled out what should have been obvious to me, that she's replaced her missing son with Dirk. And so that's what she misses. And she even says, I've, I've lost my two boys, talking about her actual son, and I'm assuming Dirk as well. Um, mm -hmm. So that scene with Julianne Moore, I'm, I'm jumping all over the place and I apologize, but that scene with Julianne Moore and Heather Graham makes a little bit more sense to me now. But also, you know, Paul... Uh, What's his actual name? Sorry. Paul Thomas Anderson, uh, he was asked, what is this movie about? And he said, uh, it's about family. And that's a uh, – I laughed when I saw that because uh, <laughs> uh, uh, when, the, when The Last Jedi came out, Carrie Fisher said that movie was about family. And uh, that's a, a clip I feel like you and I together have probably seen a thousand times. Uh, <laughs> but it is kind of about – this movie is about your not biological family, but your uh, – because it, biologically, it's definitely not. Because Julianne Moore has lost her family. Uh, mm -hmm. Dirk slash uh, Eddie, you know, his mom basically drives him out of her family. And so, like, the only actual family you have is Don Cheadle marrying that one woman. And then there was the other woman who married that uh, auto salesman. And so, like, that's actual family coming together because of the biz. Um, mm -hmm. But, like, it's about your not blood family uh you know that these guys aren't related but they're you know a very guardians of the galaxy 2 kind of definition of family gotcha uh, gotcha yeah and so it's like the chosen family yeah yeah um and so like he said you know this movie is about family and um all of that should have been a little bit more clear to me that scene with julianne moore and heather graham is what i'm saying i've been talking forever yeah. um why don't no, it's fine it's fine and I'm glad you you brushed up on that. Uh, that was something I kind of like. I was like, oh man, I was talking about you know Julianne Moore losing her son, but you alluded to it like Dirk lost his mom, mm -hmm. so he needs a mommy figure, and like he, he like he might not be as aware of the mother surrogate that Julianne Moore represents as she is of him being the son surrogate she needs. Um, but like that's like a little kind of yin yang thing going together there. Um, one thing, yeah. So, so I completely understand your interpretation of the ending about they didn't like Dirk. They they miss him as the status he represents, and um, you know Jack's films suck because Dirk's not in them anymore. And Dirk is saying he's sorry, but he's not sincere. I get where you're coming from, but I feel like he, like and, and that is like and what I think what I, what I think is going on though is I have my own interpretation and you have your interpretation, but the movie sets things up in a certain way. To where we can have these two different interpretations. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I get I get exactly where you're coming from. And when I was watching it again, I I picked up more on your side of things, but I still feel like when it comes to Dirk, it's not that he's turning favors for money that got him. You know, it, it's an it's a it's a collection of things. And during that one great scene with the firecrackers at Alfred Molina's house, there is that long shot where it just sticks on Mark Wahlberg and it just slowly dollies in on him. Mm -hmm. And you get where he's thinking, he's like, what am I doing here? What, like, what's, what are we doing? You know, like, I'm going to die if I keep, keep, if I keep going down this path. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the best acting Mark Wahlberg has ever done. And he doesn't open his mouth at all. Um, and so like, I get that from that shot. And it's, it's one of those things where like, it's a, I think a really good use of a really long take. Um, and then when it comes to Jack, there's the whole thing of they, they have to shoot things on video now. And, and he's like trying to figure out how to handle the new market in a way, you know, that still carries the spirit of the old market. And so, so they're shooting things like VHS cameras, the quality's different. They have to like, you know what I mean? They have to like turn it out really fast. And it's not, nice. and I mean, obviously, like, and you, you're right there. Like he has that new kid and things aren't working out with him. But I think like the new kid is representative of, the new technology mm -hmm. that they have to work with. Um, and then when it comes to, uh, I don't know, like Roller Girl's the one that I'm, I, maybe I'm kind of missing her her little thing of what she's really missing. But doesn't she get her GED? She It, it implies that. She tells uh, Julianne Moore, I want to get my GED. And speaking of unhealthy relationships, um, Heather Graham even says, can you be my mom? I'm going to ask you if you're my mom, and you can just say yes. And then Julianne Moore says, yes, I'm your mom. And I was like, that's weird. Like, it's, yeah. it's creepy. Um, but, yeah, she says she wants to go and get her GED. And then there, in the scene at the end where everyone is kind of like, you know, uh, we get to see uh, Don Cheadle and his new wife. They're they're giving birth, and he's uh, – they the – Julian Moore's filming a commercial for for his uh, new company, uh, and uh, there's a fun little double entendre there uh, with his commercial. Uh, and then um, 
she, uh, Heather Graham, is going back to school in that scene, uh, in that little okay. montage. So, yeah, she implies that, that. But, I mean, here's where I think the movie, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but here's where I think the movie, maybe, because it's got such a huge cast, some of the characters get the shaft, no pun intended. Um, you, you have, like, <laughs> like Heather Graham. Oh, oh that was intended. <laughs> and, maybe, yeah, yeah. It was maybe a little. Um, just, just the tip. <laughs> Heather, Heather Graham like, leaves the classroom near the beginning of the movie, we don't get any indication that she misses the education that she lost out on until that scene where she's getting coked out with Julianne Moore. And I don't, because there's a bunch of characters this movie has to juggle, it loses focus on some of them. Like, Scotty, it's pretty clear that he is obsessed with Dirk. And then it all comes to a head at the party where William H. Macy dies at that party. And he, Scotty's like, look, I bought a car. And it looks exactly like Dirk's car. And then he tries kissing Dirk. And Dirk is very clearly not into it. And then, like, Scotty just kind of gets in his car and just starts crying and, you know, you know, berating himself. And then that's pretty much it for Scotty. Um, he follows Dirk and uh, John C. Riley around throughout the rest of the movie. But we don't get a conclusion to that. He's obsessed with Dirk. But we don't get any follow-up. Like, does he find another guy that's actually interested in him? Or does he just kind of follow Dirk around for the rest of his life? Like, there's some characters who I think get, you know, uh, Julianne Moore. It, some of these characters get a happy ending. Like, Dirk kind of gets a happy ending because there at the end he says, you know, you're the star. And he's practicing his lines. And in theory, he's going to be able to do what needs to be done uh, in a pornographic film when it needs to be done. Uh, but then, like, uh, you know, Don Cheadle has a... a, a Presumably a successful business with a wife and a child. Uh, John C. Riley goes on to be a, a stage magician, but then like Julianne Moore still does not get to be with her her actual son. Uh, and so like uh, some of the characters like Scotty, you know, don't really get that happy ending. That's true. Um, what I was specifically talking about was you were talking about like what is more or less a little family unit at the end mm -hmm. that we get the little tracking shot through the house with, and you were saying that them coming together felt maybe a little phony because it wasn't sincere. Mm -hmm. And I think it is a little bit sincere because they realize they need each other yeah. in the way, like, a family needs each other. You know what I mean? Like, like I need my dad. I don't live with my dad anymore. Um, you know, like, I, I'm i independent, and I you know, can try cutting him out of my life, but at the end of the day, I, I, I need him. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And he might be my biological father, um, but, you know, maybe I never knew my biological father. We're estranged. At some point, I need to have a father figure. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so it's like I feel like they need each other the way like a fa like a traditional family would be said that they need each other. And so I believe they are sincere, and uh, th that's what I was getting at with my with my spiel. Okay, um, yeah. but you are right. Some of the characters, and, and what I what, what I was getting at is like I think like the movie does provide evidence for why it would not be sincere, and I think it does provide evidence for why it would be sincere, and it's deliberately that way so that you can have a couple of ways of reading it. Mm -hmm. Um, and cause I think like, this is a movie that, that is, that is by any, one interpretation, very sincere and one interpretation is very cynical. And I think it rides that line in a very intelligent way. Mm -hmm. Um, but you are right. Like this does have a really big cast and some like Scotty, I think does kind of, you know, get the short end of the stick. Um, I'm trying to use a euphemism that is as not charged as possible. And that was the best I could come up with. But, um, uh, but you're right. But I do think like his resolution is uh, the New Year's Eve party, and which is like halfway into the movie, or not quite halfway into the movie. Yeah, and it's like one of those things where like I think it might make sense if he blew his brains out. Yeah. But at the same time, I also understand maybe that decision where you don't want your one gay character's defining trait to be he's obsessed with a guy and he can't get him, so he blows his brains out. That's a fair <laughs> point. Yeah. And so it's like they do want to keep him around. And one thing I do like is that even though, um, like, Dirk, you know, does not have those same feelings for Scotty that Scotty has for him, Dirk still accepts him mm -hmm. and keeps him around. And I think that's maybe in that own in, in its own way that is Scotty getting what he wants. And that's like the happiest ending he could have gotten. And he got it earlier than everybody else got their happy or not so happy endings. Um, I really like a lot of like those little and I like how like some of the characters drop out a little bit like. Um, the woman, I'm trying to remember her name. She marries the car salesman. Um, um, the actress's name was Melora something, but I don't remember the character's name. It's, I, oh, I, oh, 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 no, Be Becky, Becky something. Uh, yeah, Becky Barnett. Yeah. Um, 
I remember that name was like really cool. It sounds like a comic book character. Mm-hmm. Um, but like Becky Barnett, like she kind of dips out pretty early. I was um, I was reading trivia, and apparently there was going to be a uh, subplot kind of similar to the William H Macy subplot, where her husband was eventually going to be kind of. Uh, frustrated at her uh, past uh, working in porn, and they were going to not have a happy ending. But then either it got cut just because the studio wanted it shorter, or Paul uh, Paul Thomas Anderson, sorry, uh, that was sincere. I was trying to remember his actual name. Uh, <laughs> Was like, For a you second, know, I thought you were going to call him Paul Joseph Watts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, uh, he was like, no, uh, she needs to – we need to have a character with a happy ending. And so she – like you said, she dips out, and I don't think we see her again after their uh, wedding. Um, so, and I, I was okay with that because I didn't want to see every character get, you know, a horrible ending. Like I, I, was, I, I was happy not having her end up in a bad place at the end. And likewise, Don Cheadle, like, he's the person who has to, like, face the kind of prejudice of being a pornographic actor mm-hmm. uh, later in the movie. And it would be kind of weird if you had two characters. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, and so I think it's kind of cool that her husband, as the, as is in the final cut, is accepting of it. And is, is cool with it. Yeah. Um, and it would have been weird since he met at one of these wild and crazy parties. Uh, he met her there. That he yeah. Would, <laughs> that he would have been, been not okay with it. Um, I was a, a little confused about William H. Macy. So the the actress who played his wife in the movie in real life apparently was an adult film actress. But in the movie, was she an adult film actress or was she just being unfaithful? Because um, he comes home. I, I get the. Yeah, yeah. He, he comes home and, and she's having sex with another guy and he's surprised uh, that William H. Macy is. Um, but And then later she's having sex with yet another guy outdoors and like a you know 10 people are watching and there's not a film crew there so that's not for work and then like William H Macy is distraught over that and then later he, she's again at it at a, at a party and that's where he goes and shoots her shoots the guy and then shoots himself and so i was confused is she an actress in the biz or is she just like completely unsatisfied with William, William H Macy and just you know having sex with everyone else yeah so that's an interesting uh like dynamic like thing to have in the movie um and i actually think it's like it has a cool payoff like in the last scene i don't know if you caught but there's like a what like a the the woman who don Cheadle ends up marrying does like oil paintings Mm -hmm. and at the very last scene when jack is walking down the hallway you see an oil painting of william h macy on the wall okay i saw that painting Um, but i thought that was I, I I thought that was a painting of Jack. I I should have gone back and rewatched that scene because I thought no, it's fine. <laughs> uh, but like, but going back to the William H Macy wife dynamic. So this is like some there's like there's a lot of ambiguity to that relationship, and I think it's kind of meant to be like you're supposed to like pick up on like context clues and like kind of maybe fill in your own backstory there. So mm-hmm. it's like maybe like Joker and Dark Knight ish kind of a thing. Yeah. Um. But like I what I see is that I think so he's a cinematographer. And so I think he probably met her because she was doing scenes Mm -hmm. and she would, you know, get with anybody who was willing to get with her and he was willing to get with her. Gotcha. And then, and so, uh, the, the, the involuntary, uh, cuckoldry going on there is something that what I get at is like when he, when it first happens, you're like, Oh, this is probably a new development, but it just keeps happening throughout the first half of the movie. Mm Mm-hmm. And what I get is like at is like he, it does make him angry that she does this, and it, he thinks if he acts angry, then she will eventually stop. Right. And she kind of sees through it, and so it's like um, that. That's kind of what I pick up on. That's not directly said, but that's just kind of what I'm picking up on. Um, and what I like though is that uh, so Spencer was talking to me, and he was like, well, like, like so they it's like a narrative choice. Like somebody sat down and wrote in, a, in like a you know their screenplay that this guy's gonna kill himself. And then the title card says 80s. Mm-hmm. And he was, like, wondering, like, what what does William H. Macy killing himself have to do with, like, the, it's like the 80s, there's, sorry, the 70s just died. What does him dying have to do with the 70s dying? Mm-hmm. And what I think is going on there is that, and it's kind of it's something I didn't actually think about until the very last scene when you see his oil painting. And it's like everybody's trying to, you know, go back to their glory days the way it was in the 70s. And they have that picture there where he's sort of with them in spirit. And... um. You know, it's like it's like there's a so I hate the last two seasons of The Office, mm-hmm. but the last episode of The Office has at least like one good line, and there's a part. Have you seen The Office? Uh, I, I watch. I, I know the line you're talking about. Is it when Andy said, "I wish there was a way that that line"? Yeah, I wish there was a way of knowing you were in the good old days while you were living them, mm-hmm. and um, and so it's like 
I, I get the feeling that that William H Macy represents the seventies for these characters. Like he was around, he was there, and they didn't really take much notice of him. He was just there the way right now it's 2020 mm-hmm. and 2020 just being here is just the way things are. And because it's always here, we sort of take it for granted. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're going to take it for granted because this was the COVID year, but regardless. Um, and so like when he kills himself, they're like, Oh, that's sad. But then as you know, you get older and you get older and you think about it, you're like, I, I miss, hold on. What's his name? Uh, I miss little bill. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I wish little bill were here. Um, and so like, that's, that's the impression I get at like the function he serves. And, uh, and so I don't know. I actually really like the William H Macy thing, and um, and uh, likewise I want to kind of since we're here on like the, that '80s uh, party because that's where Thomas Jane comes in, I believe, right? Because uh, yes, Scotty, believe, yeah. Scotty wants to show Dirk his card, and while they're walking out to the car, that's when he meets yes Thomas Jane. Okay, but like Scotty's there, and like you know, it's like one of those things where um, homosexual representation in film is has like a there's a lot of tropes Mm -hmm. associated with it like going back all the way to like 1941 the maltese falcon if you want to like signify a character's gay they they have to talk in a very exaggerated uh manner they have like oral fixations they're always putting pens in their mouth and you know what i mean like Mm -hmm. they're doing that and and like scotty's doing that right off the get-go and i was like oh that's that's a little interesting that uh, i i didn't think we'd still be doing that in 1997 Mm -hmm. but oh well um, but then, like, I think it's cool, though, is, like, I feel like it's almost like a deliberate choice that Paul Thomas Anderson's doing. And so when he's in the car, he's, like, crying, and we, like, sit with him, and it kind of humanizes him, and, like, we empathize with him in a way that, I don't know, I'm not used to, you know, I, 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 that, that's, like, where I was kind of at first a little surprised that we were still doing this kind of, like, gay character in the 90s. Mm-hmm. I was actually impressed that we are doing this with a gay character in the 90s. You know what I mean? Yeah. So kind of pulled the rug out from under me in a good way. And... Uh, I guess in the movie's defense, I didn't pick up on those tropes uh, with the character. Of course, I had never seen the movie before, but I was thinking that they were going to do a thing where Scotty has Scotty's been working with Jack at least a little longer than Dirk, and so I thought we were going to do a thing where Scotty was upset that like he thought, oh, maybe someday I'll get to be a star, and then this new uh... kid comes in, and so he was like, hey, you know, he they want you downstairs, but he's like, you know, pretending to be nice, but he's like really seething that like he he got passed up. And then they didn't do that. Um, so uh, that was my interpretation, at least at first. Oh, yeah. Okay, and I, I definitely see where you're coming from with that, though. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, um, I love John C. Riley in this movie. Yeah. Uh, they, at first I thought he was going to be like a rival, but then he just turns out being Dirk's wingman. Yeah. <laughs> He's and, just and a that, really low, loyal guy. They do kind of start off as like, you know, how much do you bench? Well, I bench a little bit more than you. And then it's like, <laughs> you did that flip okay. Let me show you how to do it better. But then when Dirk is fired slash quits you think like oh john c riley's gonna go and calm him down in a day or two everything's gonna be back to normal but no john c riley and scotty they run off and they break off from the rest of the crew and um i kind of like just seeing a couple guys be friends with each other Uh, they don't have to be rivals um i like that um i I, oh go ahead i also love the line i love the line hey have you seen star wars (laughs) (laughs) Uh, only like four times People say I look like Han Solo. And then, really? And then, yeah, Mark Wahlberg was like, really? I love that. That's a great line. Um, I will say I came to know John C. Riley in the mid-2000s. That was right around the time when he was doing movies like uh, Walk Hard, The Dewey Cox Story, uh, Talladega Nights, Step Brothers. And of those, I have only seen Talladega Nights. But you, watching the trailers for those movies, you get the feeling, okay, this is the kind of role that this guy does. And... I am guilty of typecasting him myself. I had this idea that this is the only kind of role that he can do. And there's some actors who I think can transition flawlessly from one type of role to another. Uh, You know, Jim from The Office, he was kind of the straight man, but it was still in a comedy series. And then he goes and does Jack... Is it Jack Ryan or Jack Reacher? Jack Ryan. He, He does a Jack Ryan Amazon Prime show, and he does, like, a lot of serious stuff. And it's like, oh, okay, that's weird, because you expect him to be... Even though he was a straight man, you expect him to be kind of in a funny environment. Um, and so John C. Riley, I kind of expect him to always be in these raunchy mid-2000s comedy movies, but he was in Guardians of the Galaxy, and he played pretty much a straight guy in that. Um, it wasn't a huge role. It wasn't like he was the star. Um, and then what I only found out like a week ago that he was in a movie. Um, the guy in this movie who's saying like uh, videotape is the way of the future, that guy. 
Um, he, yes. he and John C. Riley were in a movie around the same time with Gwyneth Paltrow, and it was about the mob in Las Vegas. I think Samuel L. Jackson was in it. I don't remember the name of the movie, but um, oh, it was. I've it, never heard of that. Uh, Sounds kind of cool. I, I'm gonna look it up while we're talking, but um, uh, it was one of those like. I'm realizing, first of all, his career started like a good 10 or 15 years before I ever came to know about him. And two, he's capable of doing acting that I did not know he was capable of. Because this is not really, this is certainly not a movie you're going to want to show your kids or your grandma. Um, I, I will say, not, not to put the spotlight on you and your family, Connor, I was surprised to hear that, like, did you watch this with your parents? Or did your mom just say you, she liked the movie and then you watched it? Oh, my mom just said she liked it. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not watching this. No, no, no. <laughs> See, that's the thing. It's like anytime I watch a movie that has any kind of nudity at all, when I have a feeling the nudity is about to happen, I'm going to conveniently be looking down at my phone and, pret yeah. and, pretend, and pretend like I don't see it. And then it's like probably everyone knows. Well, I, I know that my parents are seeing it. My parents know that I'm seeing it. But I like to pretend like, you know, I like to pretend like my mom thinks that I'm still the sweet, innocent baby and I've never seen – any human flesh at all, and so like I, I would never in a million years watch this with my parents. But anyway, um, it's just crazy how like like I'm the same way, and it's like I'm a fully grown adult. Like <laughs> it's not like I haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, but like you still like whenever you're around your parents, it's like they have like reality warping powers, and you're like a child again, and you're like, oh, I, I don't see anything. Mm -hmm. Uh, the that's movie funny. I was talking about was called Hard Eight, and that's another – I believe that's, that's – That's a Paul Thomas Anderson yeah. movie. That's his first film. Okay. I I, uh, I just found out about that movie like last week uh, or not too long ago, and then I was reading up on trivia on uh, Boogie Nights, and then it mentioned something about his first movie being Hard Eight. So when I saw that just now, I was like, oh, I'm connecting the dots now. Um, so that makes sense that Paul Thomas Anderson was kind of – Pulling some of his, uh, you know, I, I worked with these two guys and I like them on Hard Eight, so I'm gonna, you know, use them again here. Yeah. Oh man, that's crazy. Because oh, this is this is like my brain is folding in on itself right now because uh, our our friend and colleague Rasco mm -hmm. is a big fan of uh, Paul Thomas Anderson, and he has not watched Boogie Nights or Hard Eight or Magnolia, which is the film he does after this. Mm -hmm. um, but he's seen everything else. And he says like he's he's he, he says he doesn't want to watch Boogie Nights for a very long time because he's pretty sure he'll love it, and he just wants to have this one movie that he knows he's gonna love that he can look forward to for a while. Right. But um, Heart Eight started out as a short film called Cigarettes and Coffee, not to be confused with Coffee and Cigarettes, which is an independent film from the '90s directed by Jim Jarmusch. You know, okay. they're both shot in black and white. They're both about people sitting around a table talking. But they're not the same thing. But uh, cigarettes and coffee became Hard Eight, and so I've been hearing about Hard Eight for a while, and I don't know what it's about, Be just because like Rasco is like very curious about the the making of that. And so then, completely independent of this, you bring up this movie that has John C. Riley and Gwyneth Paltrow and Samuel L. Jackson's in it, and it takes place in like Las Vegas. I'm like, oh, that sounds pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, it's Hard Eight. I'm like, oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, I didn't know. Uh, I didn't even know when I was talking about it a second ago. I didn't even know it was a Paul Thomas Anderson movie either. Um, but yeah, uh, getting back to what you said, I I really like John C. Riley in this. I think he's uh, he's a good actor. Um, it it's weird to me that because he had to have started acting like in the early '90s. Like this, um, I'm gonna look his career up. Like, I'm curious if he just legitimately wanted to go into what I'm going to call like really lowbrow humor stuff, like. You know, he was in that Sherlock Holmes movie with Will Ferrell that everyone hated. And, like, is that the kind of career he wanted to have? Or is that just something that he kind of fell into? Like, you know, he... Oh, man, I don't know. He's, I, I, yeah, I don't know. Like you... I'm oh, sorry, what were you going to say? Uh, his earliest role was in 88, uncredited. But he's been acting since the very late 80s and then all throughout the 90s. So, like, I'm very hmm. curious if that was the direction he wanted his career to take. Yeah, I don't know. Um, because... Like you, I know him from the mid two thousands comedies he was in. Mm -hmm. um, I always got him mixed up with Danny McBride. Yeah, uh, yeah. But um, another one who I, when we talked about Alien Covenant forever ago, I was kind of resistant to Danny McBride not being the typical Danny McBride <laughs> type. Uh, in that, uh, I was like, I don't know. I'm always used to him being like, you know, kind of uh, the goofball in those in those types of movies. Yeah. I feel like. Danny McBride is the missing link between uh, Seth Rogen and John C. Riley. Okay, yeah, I can see that. Um, but uh, you know what's interesting? So John C. Riley, 
has, uh, you know, put on the pounds over the years. He's definitely got character actor bod going on. And uh, it was just sort of interesting looking at everybody because, like, Mark Wahlberg has also, like, thickened up. But, you know, he's, like, got, you know, jacked, mm-hmm. you know, for all the action movies he's been in. And you just kind of look at everybody. Like, Thomas Jane's the same way. Like, he just is bigger than he used to, than he was in this movie. He was so skinny in this. And it was just wild to see how skinny everybody was in this. Mm-hmm. It's like watching Do the Right Thing and you see just how tiny Martin Lawrence used to be. Yeah. But um, it, I don't know. It was actually funny. I was having this conversation um, – where I was watching old Who Reviews the Reviewers videos. Now, you look pretty much exactly the same <laughs> as you did, but, like, I put on some weight, Rasko's put on some weight, Kai is taller and has a lower voice and everything, and, like, I'm just, like, looking at everybody, and, and I was just thinking, like, oh, my... Are you familiar with the actor Jesse Plemons? Yes. Comics? Yeah. And how he was, like, Meth Damon mm-hmm. and, and Breaking Bad, and you now he's, like, put on, you know, a bit of weight and whatnot, and I was just saying, like, oh, my God, Rasko, I feel like I'm like I'm Jesse Plemons. <laughs> and then Rasko just said, we are all Jesse Plemons. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was watching this movie, and I'm like, oh, we are all Jesse Plemons. <laughs> well, uh, I'll edit this part out, but I'm actually absorbing your youth, all of you. Um... <laughs> so... You're an ancient heirloom. Yeah. You're... you're... <laughs> Okay, okay. We will have to edit that one yeah, out because, yeah. you know, you can expose it'll, it'll, Yeah, it'll undo itself, and then I'll be like Dorian Gray. I'll, I'll age like 90 <laughs> years as soon as this goes up on YouTube. Um, so um, where else did you want to go with this? I wanted to talk about Don Cheadle okay. because yeah. I really like where his character story went. Maybe, um, maybe my favorite character in the movie. I would agree with you. Um, I like how throughout the first half, He's like keeps trying to find his thing. Like he likes country western, mm-hmm. although I don't know if he actually likes country western or if he's just trying to like hop on a trend before it gets big. Yeah. You know? And 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 then throughout the whole thing, it's like he's always trying to trying to try a new look, and he's always trying to, you know what I mean, like be something he's not mm-hmm. because he just wants to be more successful than he is. And I've never seen Don Cheadle give a performance this good before. I I have not seen him in a lot of movies. Mm-hmm to be fair, but like, he's really good. And then like once the eighties roll around and he, you know, at that uh, party, he meets, uh, I don't know her name. Uh, uh, that's an actress. I'm not Laura something. That was the one I thought you were talking about earlier. I, I don't remember her, oh, the yeah. actress's last name, but, uh, yeah, the, but yeah, no, they meet each other and it's sort of like this. I was like, Oh, those, those two are going to get together. Mm-hmm. That's unexpected. But then they end up like really, I think clicking kind of well. And like the very few scenes you really get with them together. Um, but then like, you see like kind of, what he's facing trying to like, you know, just live a normal family man life and how, you know, um, you know, he's a black man. And, you know, in these kinds of, you know, movies, you expect him to be facing at the racial, racial, racial persecution. But then it kind of subverts that with, uh, you know, the they say you're a pornographer. And it's like, no, I, I'm an actor. Mm-hmm. And and um, and he has like and, and during that scene where, you know, he's talking to like the loan officer, um, th- by the way, that was another Twin Peaks connection. The guy who he's talking to on the other side of that desk plays Emery Battis in oh, Twin Peaks. He was the uh, the the guy who was in the uh, the horns uh, perfume department. Okay. Yes, yeah, and he also showed up in uh, Wayne's World okay. for a little bit too. Okay. So he's all over the nineties, yeah. but uh, yeah, that's our other Twin Peaks connection. But you know, him having to like deal with that and that all culminating in like one like it's all like end of Act Two, everyone's sad, and miserable. Mm-hmm. But then he shows up and he's got a pregnant wife in the car and he's going to go pick up some donuts. Yeah. And, and I'm like, uh oh, what's going to happen? <laughs> like, I was like thinking he was going to get shot or something. Um, but then, like, they go into, the, he's getting donuts and then, like, the donut store gets, like, held up at, by, at gunpoint. Mm-hmm. And then it just results in a freak accident where the, the safe has been emptied out. The three people who are not him in the donut shop are all dead by gunshots. And there's all the money just sitting in a bag mm-hmm. right there. I was like, I almost like stood up where I was and I just started applauding going, bravo, Mr. Anderson, bravo. This is so good. And then I'm like, I have like, honestly speaking, I have no idea what I would do in that situation. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, like you said, being a black man in the late seventies, uh, that might've been the eighties by this point, but you know, be, it, it would be very difficult to convince the authorities that you being the last one standing covered in blood, that you weren't the one who killed it. You know what I'm saying? Even if they did. Right. Be- yeah, exactly. So like, yeah. and, and he's already tried to do the right thing by going and getting a loan. And he was, he was uh, denied the loan. And so it's like, well, I, if I want to provide for my family, like I'm not condoning theft, 
but you know this guy who owns the donut shop isn't using the money anymore so you know, what are you gonna do like uh you know it's it's a it's an interesting uh development where he it's like what you said earlier where it's like we're not condoning pornography but for these characters pornography is the right path for them to take and in the same way you know don Cheadle, we never see him as a pornography actor you know when we when we meet him he's already like he's working at a uh like a electronics store and he's at the party and he meets uh mark Wahlberg, but we don't see him acting in any of jack's films so it seems like he's already trying to get out at the beginning of the movie uh and so right. he's trying to find a way to get out and be I, I just want to be a good dad and a good husband, and I just want to have a business that doesn't involve pornography. And so, like, he does something that, you know, technically is is robbery, and you know, he probably should have, you know, called the cops. And but would that have worked out for him? Probably not. Um, and so, yeah. So yeah, I, I'm with you there. Um, and one thing I think, is, uh, now that we're talking about, it, I just thought of this. Um, the, uh, like, he probably wants to get out, you know, that business by being a family man, like when he be, when he wants to become a family man because he's seen what happened to um uh Julianne Moore's character mm-hmm. and um that by the way was really sad when like her son calls the house and nobody knows her actual name yeah and well and like Louise Guzman who the only reason I, I know him is like he's a character actor where it's like oh it's that guy um yeah exactly <laughs> I, I but I've got the thing pulled up here but you know I first saw him in the Jim Caviezel uh, Count of Monte Cristo movie from the would have been around this time, maybe a few years later. Um, but he's talking to her, and he's like, I really want to be in one of these movies. I can do this. And she's like, well, I'll talk to him. And so you get the feeling that these two know each other, and they're friends, because he owns the nightclub, and when he sees Jack, it's like, you know, hey, where have you been? Uh, and he's greeting them like he's a friend. But, of course, that's that, like, fake friend thing where it's like, if you work in a business and – I used to work at a place where you had your regulars who came in every day. And so you got to know their names. You would you would say, like, hey, it's so-and-so. But you're not really friends with these people. You pretend like, you know, you, you can be nice, but you're not friends. And so that was what was going on there. Yeah. But then when they're at the party, you get the feeling, oh, maybe he knows who that is. And then he's talking to Don Cheadle, and he says, uh, we're looking for a Maggie. Who, who's, uh, who, I think they said Maggie. And, of course, like, everyone in the biz is also going to be using aliases. So, like. You yeah, know, Dirk yeah. Diggler is not his real name, and so, like, they're looking for someone named Maggie, and then no one knows who Maggie is because they only know her by her alias. And so, yeah, I agree with you. That was – that's where I'm saying it's it's a bittersweet movie because some characters get their happy ending and some characters don't. Yeah. I don't know. I, I really like this movie. Um, I, I'm i trying to think of, like, other things to talk about. Uh, is there anything else you want to talk about? Because I'm looking at – I kind of – just looking at this as a series of like character names yeah. as like a way of like going through discussions. And I think we covered all of them. Yeah. I, uh, I can't really think of anything else uh, to cover. Um, Cause I'm, I'm looking, I'm trying to look through like all the actors who are in it. Uh, and I don't see anyone uh, who it's like, Oh, we forgot to talk about so-and-so, but I'm also afraid that as soon as we stop recording, we'll both be like, Oh, I can't believe that, we forgot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Me too. I, I, did... uh, I guess I, I... Oh, sorry, oh you just... go ahead, and then I, I will have something else to say before we stop. Uh, one quick thing, and then I guess two quick things. First thing, um, the soundtrack is awesome. Yeah. Um, it's like wall-to-wall music, and all of it works, and that's really impressive because, I mean, we've both seen Suicide Squad. <laughs> I mean, that's like that's like the lowest point, you know what I'm saying? So it's like this is, I think, like, like another you know, film, uh, Goodfellas, directed by Martin Scorsese. That's another movie wall-to-wall music and it all kind of works and that's another i think that's another reason why i think this i felt a huge scorsese influence but the second thing i wanted to say was um like so uh uh heather graham uh this is probably the best i've ever seen her like i don't think i've ever seen her give like a terrible performance i've also never seen her in a whole lot of things um i you know know her because you know i grew up in the 2000s and she's hot so they put her in movies. Um, and if you like Heather Graham, you've probably already seen this movie <laughs> and know what I'm talking about. Uh, anyways, th- those are the two things I wanted to hit on. Uh, excellent. So um, one last question. Um, at the end, the, this not at the end, uh, end of Act 2, um, there's a scene in the limo. The guy that they bring in, was he the same guy who was making the faces at her at the beginning of the movie? Ah, uh, man, I, I actually, when I finished watching this and I knew I was going to watch it again, it was one of those things where I, you know, made a mental note to pay attention to that detail. 
and then I just forgot to do that. Okay, so I was just curious because uh, when he said like, and that's the only part where we hear her real name because like even on set, like when they're all just being together as friends, they they just call her Roller Girl, and so and yeah. then he says, and she's like, no, I don't know what you're talking about, but it's clear that he's kind of like penetrated her uh that really was unintended uh penetrated her 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 defenses um and she's like oh like he knows who i am for real and i don't like that um and so like i i was thinking like definitely he's someone who probably went to school with her like that wouldn't have been a mistake like he he wouldn't have been mistaken about that but i i was just curious if that was the same guy that kind of because it'd be interesting if the guy who at her lowest point is also the same guy that kind of got her out of school, you know, indirectly, like, he... Yeah. Um, but I don't know if it was. If I had to guess, it wasn't, like, the guy who it focused on, because mm-hmm. after a certain point, like, that guy's friend also starts making, uh, yeah. you know, crude gestures at her. I think it might have been that guy. Okay. I, I, I should have been paying more attention. <laughs> By the way, Robert Downey Sr. is in this film. Is he? Yes. Because um, I saw... I was reading up on the movie, and the the firecracker thing, that's apparently something Robert Downey Sr. had done in another movie. Like, he, he would... A character he played did something with firecrackers and so apparently paul thomas anderson was uh going to him to say can i use this in the movie but I, who did he play in the movie he plays the studio owner uh, uh that that's all he's credited as and like all the old people in this movie look exactly the same yeah. they're all like kind of pudgy white guys with like receded hairlines that are not completely bald and going gray like they, they all kind of look the same so you're um, not talking about the guy who said videotape is the way of the future i i don't think so okay because that guy i've seen him and stuff before he was in hard eight and he was in uh modern family uh but i i didn't i i'm now I'm, i've got the theme pulled up i need to just go ahead and like go to full cast and yeah i think that is not yeah no that that guy is he's a regular in in uh oh man i think that's robert that's the Colonel James, right? That's Robert Wrigley. Oh, no, that's, R- not, that's not who I was thinking of. I, the actor I'm thinking of is Philip Baker Hall. Um, so okay. uh, he's the one who, uh, you know, they were having the meeting. It was Burt Reynolds, Robert Baker Hall, and then the colonel was in the background of that meeting. Okay, yeah. Um, and uh, we forgot to talk about the colonel. Do you want to talk about that? How uh, he was – I mean, there's not much to say, but he was uh, – he does, doesn't get a happy ending. He was busted for child pornography and uh, – then we don't see him for much in the rest of the movie. He shows up in the montage at the end. Uh, his cellmate is beating him up. Um, did you have anything to add about that? Um, yeah, I guess the only thing I would add is uh, my is something is an observation my brother made is that you know a lot of this movie has um, you know we we talked about the the sort of predatory angle mm-hmm. of, about uh, Jack and uh, you know and I guess like to a degree like that is kind of showing the consequences of their kind of predatory mm-hmm. uh, tactics. So. Well, and even the predators, uh, Julianne Moore and Jack, we don't see how Julianne Moore reacts, but when Jack starts to hear, oh, there's another thing, and then he, like, he starts to, like, you know, his face falls. And it's like even even this guy who is a predator towards uh, Mark Wahlberg, he, even he has his standards. And he's like, no, you're – like, the guy says, you're still my friend, right? And then the – the the phone dies i i didn't understand how that worked was he supposed to put in a, a quarter or something to continue the conversation <laughs> like, i'm being serious like because no 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 he uh he i think the thing is like it's like that thing where like when somebody hears like shocking news and like the sound just gets drowned out oh and i think like he's also keeping the phone away from him so he can't actually hear yeah. him because he's on another side of glass so he's like deliberately not listening to okay. him because he's taking phone away from him well, i i knew I, I picked up that he was like no we're not friends I, I picked up on that but i i thought that it was like a technical thing and then it was like you have a choice you can resume the conversation or you can just hang up and then he hangs up but okay i understand that then um but yeah that was uh i guess that was one thing we forgot to say uh i did want to mention so you mentioned that paul thomas anderson was super young when this movie came out he and Burt Reynolds did not get along with each other. Uh, Burt Reynolds. Oh, really? Yeah, Burt Reynolds hated working with this, and apparently distanced himself from the movie. Uh, I don't. I don't know if the subject matter was just something he wasn't comfortable with, because like he apparently, uh, he uh, various quotes that I'm. Yeah, I'm going to be paraphrasing here. He visited various uh, porn studios and said he felt like he needed to like you know wash, take a shower afterwards. Um, he also like 
uh, auctioned off his Golden Globe that he won for the movie, um, and uh, said, "Oh my God!" Said that he would uh, he would never work with Paul Thomas Anderson again. Uh, and it, apparently, according to a couple of different people, actually tried to punch Paul Thomas Anderson. Um, but he uh, and that would have been the scene where, uh, what's his name, Philip uh, Philip Baker Hall uh, says, like, you know, here's the new kids, and then he here's my boys and here's my girls, uh, because one of those actors. Uh, was in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Tom Link uh, is the actor's name, uh, and Tom Link was saying that like Burt Reynolds was throwing punches at uh, um, ta- Paul Thomas Anderson, and um, Paul uh, apparently like they had filmed one shot, and Paul Thomas Anderson was like, "Isn't this a great shot?" And uh, Burt Reynolds was like, "Yeah, it's just like these five other movies that have done it already." And so like, <laughs> it's yeah, oh apparently God. there was just not a good relationship there between them, uh, which is understandable because like you said. Paul Thomas Anderson was young. He very much he he is an auteur, and with that comes a fair amount of ego. And when you think you've done something incredible, you want to brag about it, brag on yourself, toot your own horn. And Burt Reynolds has been acting since the '70s, so he he kind of he knew what he was doing, and so like he he probably was right in saying like you know you're you're getting a little too big for your britches, son. Um, kind of reminds me of a similar situation with Tim Burton and Jack Palance on Batman. Uh, I think that was kind of a similar oh. uh, ego trip there between where actors and directors just couldn't really be in the same room with each other. Well, you know what? I, I'll say Burt Reynolds is an absolute professional because I think he is great in this movie and he sells every scene he's in. Yeah. He uh, was actually, this came out the same year as Jackie Brown, and both Burt Reynolds and Robert Forster were up for Best Supporting Actor at this huh. Academy Awards. Uh, they both lost, however, to Robin Williams in Good Will Hunting. Do you think that was a? Uh, do you think Robin Williams earned that win? Well, I have not seen Good Will Hunting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not... This was also the same year Titanic won everything. Oh, so. well. <laughs> good, good, good on you, Robin Williams. I'll just say that. I also have not seen um, Good Will Hunting, so. I know that's like a movie everybody loves. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, 1997 was quite quite the year. Um, I guess I uh, I wanted to say that that's wild that he auctioned off his. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, that's funny. Yeah, I, uh, well, apparently, like he was offered the role multiple times and was very not interested. And then he finally got mad at Paul Thomas Anderson and said, "Like, leave me alone." And Paul Thomas Anderson said, "If you can channel that anger into your role, you will win an Oscar." And I don't. I don't know if he won an Oscar. Apparently, I saw that he had auctioned off a, glo- a Golden Globe, but um, he, uh, you know, after the movie, he kind of like he didn't do press releases for it or anything. So I don't know. You know, apparently he was put off by the subject matter, but then he was convinced to do the movie. But then I guess what really put a sour taste in his mouth was working with Paul Thomas Anderson. Um, so it's weird though that he was already like, I don't want to do a movie about porn, but then he accepted the role. But then was like, still angry during and after the movie. Maybe he agreed to do it, and then while he was in the middle of making it and after it, he figured it wasn't worth that it. That could be, yeah. Um, and I guess I don't know. A lot of people in the industry don't like the Golden Globes; they think they're worthless. So oh, okay. <laughs> uh, but maybe I, I'm curious to know how uh, how shortly after the uh, the Golden Globes that he auctioned that off. Uh, because if that was like a news story shortly after the Golden Globes, then that's probably why he didn't get an Oscar for it. Yeah, that could be. I all I saw was that he auctioned it. I didn't see when the auction was. Yeah, that's poli- that, That's Hollywood politics for you, ladies and gentlemen. Yep. Isn't it so magical? Did you have any other final thoughts on this movie? Uh, I'm sure I will after we finish recording. But right now, I'm I'm pretty content. I thought this was a good conversation. Yeah. Um. I. Uh... I enjoyed the movie more than I thought I would. Okay, he auctioned it in 2014. Um, oh, oh. The statuette oh. sold for $21,250. Um, so wow. someone thought it wasn't worthless. Um, and I guess... I'll bet you Quentin Tarantino purchased it. <laughs> and then and then when Quentin Tarantino was getting things ready for uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, he was like, hey, you want to be in my movie? Um, yeah, I bought, your, I bought your Golden Globe. You should be in my movie, man. Um, and then uh, Burt Reynolds, despite Quentin Tarantino, agreed to do it and then said, I'm going to die on you <laughs> before I can be in your movie. And so he did that. I haven't seen that movie. Who was he supposed to be? Was he supposed to be the Brad Pitt of the movie or? Uh, no. So there's a part where Brad Pitt. So like the way that movie is structured is like it. Most of it takes place over the course of one day. And then it kind of follows three people as you're just hanging out with them on their day. Mm-hmm. And Brad Pitt like goes on this like weird uh, like like 
journey to like Spawn Ranch where like the Manson family's hanging out mm-hmm. and he uh goes to meet the guy who owns Spawn Ranch named George and then Bruce Dern is like g- g- blind and just sitting on a bed and is like drugged out of his mind or something he's not well and uh that was supposed to be Burt Reynolds originally okay so well it makes sense he went to Bruce Dern because he was also in the Hateful Eight another yeah. you know so uh I also do not have anything left to say about this movie uh, and that means we have come to the part of the podcast where I choose what uh, we are going to uh, do next. And uh, once again, Connor, I am choosing something I have never seen before. So uh, the typical warning, uh, I, I should say this is an episode of a TV series. I have seen <laughs> elements of this TV series before, <laughs> but I have not seen this episode before. Uh, but the last time I chose a TV series, I chose something that was like six episodes before the series ended. Now I'm choosing the very first episode of the series. So we'll get to experience it in a, a little bit of a different way. Uh, I'm choosing the first episode of the 1990s sitcom The Nanny. Whoa. This ha- nice. I've never seen a full episode of the series, but I've watched like montage clips and such. Um, so I'm, I'm familiar with the premise of the series. Uh, our Twin Peaks connection is the actress Madeline Zima who was in oh, yeah. the first episode of Twin Peaks The Return. Uh, she was the woman who had sex with a guy in the room with the thing. Uh, and uh, she was a child actress. Uh, I did not know this uh, for a very long time because I first saw her in Heroes, I think. She was uh, played Claire's roommate in a season of Heroes. But um, she is one of the three children of the uh, male lead of the nanny. And so I'm going to go ahead and say... Our Twin Peaks connection is not going to be very big in this episode because she would have been super young. Uh, That series started in 93. She was born in 85. So she's not going to be just like front and center of this episode, I'm going to guess. But that's a close Twin Peaks connection. So I wanted to to do something a little different than what we normally do. No, I like that. And it's pretty clever. You know, we were talking about Boogie Nights. There's some naked people. She got naked in the first episode of Twin Peaks The Return. So, hey, there's like connective tissue. This is, this is it's all, like poetry. It's all connected. It's, it's like poetry. It rhymes. And it's all about family. And that's yeah, what makes it so important. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I'm actually uh, interested because I remember when I uh, was younger, the nanny played on Nick at Night all the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, Fran Drescher was in UHF. Okay. And, uh, if you don't think I'm not going to try my terrible and annoying Fran Drescher <laughs> impression, you guys got another thing coming, <laughs> all right? Um, real quick, if anyone wants to follow along, this episode is on YouTube for free, and it looks like this channel is cer- uh, certified. So probably this episode is not going to be taken down before we record. Um, I-, I can send you the link, though, Connor, but it's on YouTube. It's titled, The First Episode of The Nanny! Exclamation <laughs> point. Full episode, <laughs> The Nanny. So, um... That's uh, that's where you can watch it if you wish for free. It's not even like a pay-to-rent kind of thing. So that's what we'll be nice. talking about next time. Well, that sounds awesome. Cool. Uh, in the meantime, I'm the Comics Kid 2099. And I'm Connor Nielsen. And we will see you guys in the future. Sonny, thank you for the smile upon your face. Sonny, thank you for the gleam that shows its grace.